Whatever you think the Acolyte is, it's not that. This not being necessarily a love letter to Jedi. This is the most exciting thing. We're filling in on that Jedi backstory, which is not just simply Jedi good, Sith bad. It's a little bit more gray and there's some more nuance there. Let's get into that, hoping this is what we're going to explore. Welcome everyone to Krypton to Alderaan. I'm Joey, your Star Wars lover, and with me is Royish Goodlooks, your Star Wars song guy. Hello, Joey. Hello, podcast. Hello, and we're the podcast that analyzes nerdy pop culture, but it's mostly Star Wars. And today we are going to be discussing the upcoming live action show, The Acolyte. Woo! But first, we are still on our road to 1,000 subscribers. We would really appreciate your help. Subscribe if you haven't already. Tell your friends, get us out there. Like the video so YouTube tells its friends to subscribe. We are so excited to be getting there. I think we're at 875 at the time of this recording. We're really getting close. It's all very exciting. We really appreciate everyone's support. Help us out. Help us get to 1,000. That would be great. That's enough of that. I want to get into talking about this show. I'm super excited, so let's punch it. We are but a few days away from the two-episode premiere of the most different Star Wars show of all Star Wars shows, The Acolyte. And I think it's not going to go the way we think. As Leslie Headland has said, whatever you think The Acolyte is, it's not that. It's a drop in the buckets, baby. Just hang in there and check it out which is exactly what I want to do. I am pretty much all the way in at this point. I'm so excited to finally have our first live action High Republic show, an era of Star Wars that is completely new and I am completely in love with. It's been around for a few years in the form of books and comic books and some shows, uh, Young Jedi Adventures animated show that is set during the High Republic. I know nothing about the High (laughs) Republic. Other than what you've occasionally brought up on the podcast or, you know, texted mm-hmm. off air. Yeah, we're outside of the Mandoverse, you know, Ahsoka, Book of Boba Fett, The Mandalorian, whatever other Rangers of Republic shows that remain to be seen from that potential era. It's not the classic in between Sith and the original trilogy, like the Bad Batch, right. Rebels. I love that era, but we're not there either. We are, in fact, hundreds of years in the past, a prequel to the prequels in that. We've got a lot of freedom, but if they're saying it's not what we think it is, you know, what what do you think I think it is, is, is the question no one is asking. <laughs> How come nobody asks me what I think it is? Well, you've come to the right place. We're going to tell you what we think it is. So there was two, two official trailers. I did not like trailer one nearly as much as trailer two. Like trailer one, I had a tepid take towards it where it was like, I'm going to need to see more. Before You said you're totally in. Uh They definitely withheld some of the juicy nuggets in that trailer. Trailer two went a little deeper. And then we got a ton of clips. And it's like, if they're saying we don't know what this show is about, well, I know that someone's hunting Jedi. And that seems to be a very pivotal thing that you're talking about in these trailers. So that would be wonderful if there's still a lot more to the show than just that. Because it does seem like they find out that they're being hunted and then they figure out who's connected to the potential hunters. I think that's the thing. Like the bad guys are maybe not yet fully revealed because we have that one Padawan that says, you know, it's not me. I didn't do it. You have to believe me. Or is that May? Yeah, that's May. She seems to be confronted and and saying it's not what you think even kind of in the trailer itself becomes a little bit meta there. Right. So I, I, I would love to know that there's more than just the trailers within the eight episodes that were we're going to be given. But I am more excited than I was for that first trailer with the more that they are revealing. I think it's going to be a fun journey. I'm going to give it some runway in that we're in this new era. We've got these new characters. I'm not coming in with nearly as much baggage as I could possibly come into with almost any of the other series, maybe aside from The Mandalorian. You know, we didn't know much about Mando. Nothing really, unless you just had watched Rebels or Clone Wars and you were familiar with The Mandalorian people. Uh, Right. So, I'm going to try to leave the preconceived notions at the door. Yeah, I think that's fair. There's another meta moment with Master Saul. I think it's in that first trailer where they are going around the room and he's like, your eyes can deceive you. Usually 
I get to the point where like, I don't want to see any more clips. I don't want to see any more trailers. I don't want to see any more clips. I don't want extra stuff to be given away. And I was very much there, but I knew we were going to do this episode. So I wanted to come to the table with as much knowledge as possible. So I watched it all. Every clip is almost exactly the same, right? It's either the fight with maybe May, who knows, put an asterisk there, May and Master Saul, May and Master Indara, Carrie Ann Moss, like you're saying, like chasing her and her on the cliff saying it's not me. You know, when we get little bits of stuff and we see like the end scene in the first trailer with all the Jedi lighting up their lightsabers and the red lightsaber in the second trailer, we get to see a old zipper, Darth zipper face <laughs> there. Anyway, so I was really worried they were going to give too much stuff away. And it really seems like, I mean, it's just not the case because most of the clips are reused in every like iteration of clip we've got. And it also got me very amped up to see. It got me very excited. I love this like mystery crime thriller aspect of it that they're going for. There is this mystery, oh, somebody's killing Jedi. And then we get characters like York Fandar, I think his name is, saying it doesn't make sense. There's all this mystery and it's a whole new genre for Star Wars. Like there were episodes of the Clone Wars where they go on these like dark, gritty, underground, whodunit, mystery type things in terms of like a full fleshed out thing in terms of live action. This is like a a whole new lane for Star Wars to be in, even though it has all of the traditional what I love about Star Wars stuff, the force, Jedi, the martial arts and choreography looks amazing. We get all those amazing fight scenes. There's action. I believe there's also going to be a significant amount of emotion and heart. I'm crossing my fingers for all of that. But on top of all of that, on top of like making sure we know it's within the Star Wars universe, it is a mystery, thriller, crime show about a Jedi and maybe a series of Jedis like trying to solve this mystery and trying to like catch this bad guy who's killing Jedi. So I really like that. Like we've talked about before, we're branching out. Star Wars can exist in any genre. We have the Westerns. We have this mystery crime stuff, political thrillers with Andor. We're expanding the Star Wars box and thinking outside the Star Wars box, as we like to say. Totally. And I think that's why the two trailers needed to be kind of back to back for me to be fully sold is they had to teach you what the tone is going to be like. They could easily have just distilled this down. You're saying like, we know it's in the Star Wars universe. Like everybody's got a lightsaber. You know, there's Jedi, there's Padawan, and maybe there's Sith. This could have just simply been a like, my student is turning to the dark side, the kind of Kylo Ren thing, and I've got to turn them back to the good side. This could have been a very clear cut good versus evil, which is so much of Star Wars and already very trotted ground. But this idea that the Jedi are then connected to this Sith or the Acolyte through a former Padawan, that we can then branch out into even more the things that have yet to been fully revealed, hopefully, within the trailer. I love the line in Phantom Menace when Maul tells Palpatine, at last, we'll reveal ourselves to the Jedi, which is very interesting because this show seems to be doing just that hundreds of years earlier. But then maybe the really juicy nugget here is that the Sith or the Acolyte, the dark side users, are going to reveal themselves to the Jedi and then also somehow jump back in to the shadows which I think is really interesting. Like, that's the cool part of the world that I hope we get to explore, not just simply like, my Padawan went to the dark side. We've got to teach them to turn their cat around. This is speculation, but based on some other stuff Leslie Headland has said in interviews about this not being necessarily a love letter to Jedi. This is going to be critical of the Jedi. This is going to be like, the Jedi maybe will root for the Jedi, but the Jedi are kind of the antagonists of this and that they are like the bad guys to the bad guys, as she has said. Maybe we'll still be backing them and their fight through this, but there's going to be a more, more complicated relationships here, like between Saul and May. There's a description of May saying that she's out for revenge. She's determined to exact vengeance on those who wronged her, which, as Darth Vader says, is not the Jedi way. So there's a lot of complicated themes here. There's a lot of complicated relationships here. We know that Master Saul, by his description, is also a very emotional Jedi and uses his Jedi training to keep all of that in check. These are not the one-dimensional 
the Jedi of the prequel era were not good guys either, but they were more like one-dimensional from what we saw in the movies, very arrogant. There's no way Darth Maul could be a Sith. We would know because they were so full of themselves at that point. We didn't have the complicated relationships or complicated themes that I think we will have in this. We did have some of that with Anakin, but I think this is going to be much more nuanced than a lot of that stuff. And we're going from like peak High Republic, Jedi were the perfect Jedi. What we were supposed to think the Jedi were supposed to be. That was the Jedi like peak High Republic. Good guys, protectors of the galaxy, not really seen that way by everyone in the galaxy, but they were doing their best to help people. Now, between that, which is the storyline the books and comic books took place in, to the prequel trilogy, we're getting smack dab in the middle of that to maybe like the Jedi leaning more towards getting to where they are in the prequel trilogy, where they are very arrogant. I guess they don't go out in the galaxy all that much anymore. They don't believe that like the bad guy could be right under their noses. We're seeing that progress. Like you said, we are seeing something like a Sith reemerge here. But we have Maul in the prequel trilogy saying, at last, we will reveal ourselves after a thousand years or whoever had the line about a thousand years. Does this point the Jedi to being more corrupt, traveling on that path further to where they end up in the prequels by covering up this story eventually? They're going to meet this bad guy. They're going to meet this Sith or Sith acolyte or Knight of Rend or whoever this character is. But everyone else seemingly in the Jedi Order in the future thinks that they haven't seen a Sith for a thousand years. Yeah, this is the most exciting thing, I think, about this particular show is they reveal themselves, they come back into the shadows. Why? How? What leads to that? I love that you're saying, you know, the one-dimensional Jedi in the prequels. You know, as a 10-year-old watching Phantom Menace, you know, you root for the good guys. Like, you're supposed to, that's what it is. And then the more you kind of peel back the onion, the layers on the onion, then you can start to build a more full, complete view. Just like we're talking about with all the animated shows. You gotta watch Clone Wars. Filling in the gaps of these live (laughs) action series or the movies. Yeah, we're filling in on that Jedi backstory, which is not just simply Jedi good, Sith bad. That works for a nice, clean bedtime story. That's not reality. And this is what makes some of Star Wars series like Andor, you know, and hopefully here in the Acolyte so much more interesting. Let's get into that to where it's it's a little bit more gray and there's some more nuance there. And man, the prequel Jedi, with some more of this context, they're kind of boring, man. Like you said, they just sit around. They don't even get off their butts when they're given this information that there might be a Sith out there. So cool in the Acolyte, they seem to go right on the hunt. They start playing detective. They're peacekeepers, but they're, you know, detectives, they're researchers, they're they're scientists, you know, whatever. Like, they're on the ground doing the work that they need to do to then maintain peace. You don't maintain peace, you know, with, with a lightsaber. You can't just walk out there with a laser sword. You've got to do some more work there, which it seems like the Acolyte era Jedi are going to do. But then they don't succeed or they run into this brick wall of we've got to now lie to the general public to, like, continue to maintain the peace. Is that what the other character is saying about the Jedi their piece is a lie. You know, is that part of this, you know, this plot to like conceal the Sith from being fully revealed? Yeah, that's really interesting. If the good guys hide the existence of the bad guys, my mind's being blown right now. I'm hoping this is what we're going to explore. Yeah, these complicated relationships. And like you said, Kamir, he's a former smuggler by the description of his character. And he's saying that the Jedi, they think they are protecting peace and establishing peace, but their peace is a lie which a lot of other creators, I think, have pointed out at this point, is a line directly from the Sith Code. So there's speculation to be done there a little bit. Like, is this guy in league with this Sith-type person? Is he the Sith that we see? Speculation can go on for days. But it's pointing to these, like, more complicated relationships of maybe some anti-Jedi conversations going on out in the galaxy because they have stopped fighting or do not fight for the everyday people of the galaxy's best interest. And I think those are really juicy, like maybe more politically intriguing details that I really hope get fleshed out in this show, along with 
the lightsabers and the action and all of that stuff. The gratuitous lightsabers. So, but is this the, it's not what you think it is? Is it something aside from this? Is is this the bait and switch that it's not actually about good versus evil at all? And there's something else there. And we're going to talk about midichlorians and other, you know, <laughs> left of center Star Wars content. Or have we thought enough about it that this is sort of where it's going? The anti-Jedi sort of plot line. So I love this. A great thing about this is how like impassioned we're getting over just talking about what this show could be. Like I said, I love the High Republic, so I'm super excited for this show. And I think you're really going to like it as well, Royce, and hopefully listeners as well, because you even just mentioned like peeling back the onion, which is also like a direct quote from Leslie Headland about this show. Like it's an onion. Every episode's going to be a new layer and it's not going to be what you think out of the box. I can do a lot of speculation about May and are there two of her? Is, is there like possession or mind control going on, which we do see a bit of in the trailer? Who's the Sith? You know, what's why are the Jedi fighting each other at one point? There's so much speculation we can do. But the much more intriguing conversation here that we've stumbled into is the complicated relationships that we are going to get to see. What does it mean? What does it mean for the galaxy that the Jedi are not like the heroes of the galaxy? And we're going leading into those prequel era Jedi from the like peak Jedi of the High Republic. So we just don't know what she's referring to when she says, whatever you think it is, it's not, which is super, super exciting. I'm so glad that one specific quote from her is just so good and just fills me with so much excitement. We talk so much about how we want more than the pew pews. They mention Master Saul being a very emotional Jedi. We see clips of seemingly emotional moments, the little bits that we do in the trailers and the clips. So I'm also excited for this to have the Jedi, Sith, Force stuff that I love about Star Wars with the emotional storytelling that, like we said on our previous episode, the majority of which we see in animation. This is the exact same conversation I had about the, what I wanted from the Ahsoka show. We got a little bit, not a whole lot, I think, of like real hard-hitting emotional moments. So I'm excited to see if this show will have that. We might be setting some expectations, but hopefully these are kind of realistic ones. I, I love this idea of peeling back the layers and the onion. I would love depth was one of my biggest notes that I took. I just want to be genuinely pulled in to your story. I want you to surprise me. Even if I have expectations, I do want you to subvert them in at least a satisfying way that, oh, I, I couldn't have thought of that. You thought of that though, and you twisted it and that, that made it a great story. Oh, you know, like I didn't realize what was actually going on. And then when you get to the end, it all pays off. And or there's no lightsabers in that show whatsoever. There's a lot of pew pews and there's some iconography that we're familiar with and, and maybe some cameos that we're familiar with. But the show does not rely on the force, you know, lifting rocks, masters and Padawans, the classic, very classic Star Wars stuff, and is still great. This series does seem to rely pretty heavily on lightsabers and the force and masters and Padawans, but hopefully it still has more there as well, that you could still do really genuine, heartfelt, emotional storytelling with or without the pew pews, right? Because we have all of those genres to play with within these series. But depth takes time. In Ahsoka, we've got the scenes that linger for a moment. Not quote-unquote exciting, but moments that can draw you in if you're open to them, if that's the kind of storytelling you want, which you and I are interested in, maybe selfishly. That's not what everyone's tuning in for. If you just see the lightsabers and the Sith and you want to just see all the action, you know, but I want those slower moments. But you need time or you have to figure out how to fit those in and this was a lot what we talked about last week of the difficulty that live action has finding the time, even just for the darn show, period. This is a gripe I've had year after year, show after show, season after season on the podcast here. And I took some time this past week to crunch some numbers. We've got 57 live action episodes over five shows, seven seasons, 57 episodes. This is a lot of Star Wars TV we've been spoiled with. The average runtime for one episode of all of those 57 episodes, this surprised me, 46 minutes. This is live action. Live action only, not Bad Batch, yeah. not Rebels or whatever. 
all the live action series, 46 minutes from beginning to end, including the intro and the, and the credits at the end, which I was like, wow, that's actually like, seems pretty significant. On average, it is 46 minutes <laughs> over those 57 episodes. The kicker is the difference between the longest episode and the shortest episode on average for all live action Star Wars shows is 20 minutes between the shortest and the longest. So we could reasonably expect from the Acolyte an episode to be 56 minutes and then the next week to be 36 minutes. This does not bode well for these, you know, emotional moments that you can get them jam-packed one week and then the next week does not carry the thread. Inconsistency kind of runs rampant in Star Wars live action. Man, there's so much here with like, how much will this play into our enjoyment of the show? The Acolyte is only eight episodes long. There's potential for season two. It's not just going to be a one and done season if it does well. Leslie Headland has said that it's not going to end on like some big cliffhanger, emotional or otherwise. So it will be more of a self-contained season, but there is the potential to do more. But for now, eight episodes at whatever the runtime will be. Are we going to end every week thinking I want more because it was too short? I really hope not because I really, really want this to be good. Man, you have brought me down a peg here. I don't really want us to be like the one thing I didn't like was the runtime, you know, because I just want it to be perfect. This could be another opportunity to go into a thing with reasonable expectations. I am going to be excited about it. We know that there are inconsistent runtimes. We're still going to be a little bit annoyed, but that's not necessarily something that we will be surprised about if it happens. Right. That's the expectation that yeah. it's going to be up and down. Right. Based on the previous shows, that's what we can like infer. So we have everything we need to set a good foundation so that our expectations, we can be excited for it, but we know where the lines are. We know that the runtime might be short. We know that the Jedi won't be necessarily good guys. We know that it might not be what we expect all the way throughout the thing. So we have all the tools we need to sit back and enjoy it. And if it doesn't sound like it's for you, you don't have to watch it. You're going to have to put that on a t-shirt one day, Joey. <laughs> yeah, I think this is, it's fair to like, think about how you've evaluated the previous shows, whether that's just content, dialogue, music, you know, visual filmography, you know, whatever it is, and use that to say, here's what I would love if they continued into this new series. Here's what I would love if they didn't do this thing from another series. But you just have to be along for the ride. We've said this so many times, just be open for it. And th there has been a lot of stuff in the promo that's gotten me genuinely excited about the plot. There's plenty of things that you're saying on these interviews that are getting me excited. That's probably just the best way to do it. Rather than having an expectation, just be, like you said, be excited, not cautiously optimistic. Just go into it thinking, hey, I bet this is going to be a lot of fun. Pick the things that you love from it. But I will come back here week to week, I promise you, to give you some <laughs> updates. I'm really fascinated with these statistics of like the runtime. Yeah. Because if nothing else, I think consistency is important. Come back to hear us talk about how long the episodes were <laughs> next week. <laughs> Oh God! I'm excited for it. Joey, you're excited for it. Listeners, though, we would love to keep this conversation going. Drop your comments. If you're here on YouTube, leave your wild speculations on plot and runtime <laughs> and make sure to subscribe to help us get to our 1000 subscriber mark. We're almost there. Join us for the journey. We'd really appreciate it. And make sure to tune in next time for more nerdy pop culture but mostly the Acolyte for the next seven weeks. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the show today. I've been Royce. I've been Master Saul. And we've been Krypton, Krypton to Alderaan. Couldn't think of any planet names from this show. 